Welcome everyone. Have a seat. Um, so my name is Marko Dimiashevic, and today I will talk about function totality and hopefully by the end of this talk I will convey this idea that uh, totality does help in uh, achieving abstraction uh, in, in your programs. So briefly about me, uh, I'm from Croatia and I work as a formal methods engineer at a company called Input Output Hong Kong. And I did my doctoral dissertation um, in the US at the University of Utah on the topic of uh, automatic software testing. And while I was there, I also had a chance to uh, spend some time at NASA and, and do research on a related topic. Uh, and in general, I'm, I'm interested in uh, two things. So one is uh, how to uh, write correct software, and in particular via type systems. And then uh, the second part is how to um, write complex program, pr pr programs and how to reduce their complexity um, by embedded domain-specific languages. This is the, the outline of the talk, so I will give you a brief introduction. I will talk about exhaustive pattern matching, uh, then about termination and productivity. Um, the last chapter is totality, and finally I will conclude. Uh, there will be plenty of time, uh, I believe, for questions. So if, if you will have uh, questions, uh, please save them for the end. So let's start. Uh, function totality is a concept that combines two things. One is termination and the other one is productivity. And uh, why are they important? Why would anyone care about them? So uh, a very practical perspective on function totality is that it helps you to reduce the number of runtime errors that, that your program has. And of course, the second one is while you're working on, on, on your program, um, totality helps you to uh, abstract away from lower level details. And as you will see in the talk, types, as in type systems and type theory, play a central role. Um, we will, of course, cover functions. Um, and in particular, we will use this style of writing functions via equations and pattern matching, which is quite common in, in functional programming. And I will use uh, code examples in Haskell and Idris. So hopefully, or maybe just a, just hands, who is uh, working with types in, in, in programming languages? Oh, okay, so quite a few. Hopefully, yeah, this will not be too hard to follow. So briefly about abstraction. Uh, abstraction is often used, as, often seen as something that is very hard and very vague. Um, but um, there is a nice quote by Edgar Dijkstra who said that the purpose of abstraction is not to be vague, but to create a new semantic level in which one can be absolutely precise. And hopefully by the end of this talk, I will convey this idea that we are not being abstract here to be vague, but to actually help us in building higher level uh, parts of our programs where we don't have to worry about what's, what's underneath them. And what is common in functional programming is to use functions as, as components, as our building blocks. So we write smaller components first, and of course use them in building bigger and bigger, uh, bigger blocks. And this is one way of, of using abstractions. Um, so we abstract over smaller, small, smaller functions. As I mentioned, I will use Haskell and Idris with code examples, so briefly about these two languages. Probably you know uh, at least about Haskell. So both of them are pure uh, uh, functional programming languages. And uh, maybe you've heard people talking about such languages as it's like doing mathematics, and this is for a reason. Um, because you can really kind of write equations and what's on the left-hand side equals to the right-hand side 
throughout the program execution. It doesn't change over time. And Haskell was uh, introduced in 1990 and Idris much later in 2009. And unlike Haskell, Idris uh, uses a strict elevation by default. Haskell's type system is based on parametric polymorphism. Um, and uh, a common feature there is to use algebraic data types. And what Idris brings new compared to Haskell is that it has dependent types. These are uh, types that depend on values. And both can be seen as general purpose programming languages, but on top of that, Idris can also be used as a, a theorem proving assistant thanks to these uh, dependent types. So briefly about types, um, you can see them as sets in mathematics. So here is a simple example. We can create a, a type called vehicle that has two possible values, a car or a motorcycle. And from there, we can build a more complex data type, a person, which has only one data constructor. Let's call it make person. And it, it can uh, receive two arguments. One is an integer, let's say the age of a person, and, and a, a vehicle argument meaning this person can own either a car or a motorcycle. Uh, functions are, of course, heavily used in functional programming. And here is just a simple example that takes a value of the person type into a value of the vehicle type. So this is uh, a first example where we use these um, definitions via equations and, and in particular pattern matching. So we deconstruct the value of type person directly and just return its second argument. So types basically determine the kind of data that our functions work with. And uh, as you will see throughout the talk, they also direct the uh, termination and productivity checking, uh, in particular um, in, in the Idris that I will, of course, uh, give some examples in. And finally, um, what is really nice about Idris and similar languages is that um, compilers check uh, if, if uh, our types that we've wrote down um, match the expected types. But OK, that's, that's the case in Haskell as well. But you will see a more advanced usage in, in Idris. So uh, um, a very important topic in, in uh, totality checking is exhaustive pattern matching. And here is, here is a, a simple example of it. Uh, so if we take a function that should take a list and return its head, uh, this is how we would usually define it. Uh, so we would just say, for some list that has a head and a tail, and we don't care what this tail is, just return the head. As you might have noticed, we haven't covered all the cases. We haven't performed exhaustive pattern matching because, of course, given the type, we can also pass in an empty list. Um, so what happens with this empty list case? And because the way this function is defined, uh, we say it's a partial function. It's not de defined on its whole domain. And the domain is uh, a list of any values. So we what we could do is introduce the empty case type, empty yeah, case, uh, case, the empty list case. Um, and one solution is to simply call the error function provided by the Haskell standard library. But still, we will run into an error once we call the head function on an empty list. So it feels rather unsatisfactory what to do here. So what we could do is to change the, the type of the function. So here, we change the return type from A to maybe A, because we want to communicate the possibility of either failure, or in this case, um, the, the part of the domain that this function is not defined on. So here, we just say for the empty list, we return uh, a value that is nothing. And of course, if it's a non-empty list, we return this just in the head. 
So let me try to, to work on a slightly more complicated example. Let's say you want to write a function that greets a vehicle owner. And here is the problem description. So if you have the if you have an underage person, and let's say it's 18, um, then we say that this person is not allowed to um, own a car or a motorcycle. And then the other case is okay, it's at least 18, and then it can have either a car or a motorcycle. So basically we have three possible cases here. So if we write this in Haskell, this is how we would do it. As in a slide before, we have the vehicle and the person data type, and we have this greet function. So it takes a person and returns a greeting string. And we simply do it by using these so-called guards, where we check what's the age of, of the person. So here we have those three cases. The first one is when the person is underage. Um, and simply in that case, we don't care what's the value uh, for the second argument in the, in the make person data constructor. And we just return a message saying, hey, you're not old enough to drive. And then we have these two other cases when the person is at least 18. So uh, the person can either have a car or a motorcycle and we return uh, a corresponding message. And if you look at this implementation, you would say, well, we covered all cases, right? And it would be really nice if our compiler could uh, check this for us. So let's see what happens. Uh, a de facto standard compiler for Haskell is the Glasgow Haskell compiler. And if we ask it to, to check if uh, this covers all cases, it says it doesn't, which is really strange. So why did it say that? It says it hasn't covered these patterns, regardless of the age, when the person has a car, and the second one when it has a motorcycle. If you go back and look, we covered that, so okay, when the, the age is at least 18, we cover it in these two cases. And when the age is under 18, we cover it with the first case. So this is really puzzling, like why is it saying that? And let's see how to do this in Idris. Uh, my apologies, I will come to that. Um, so, so we have a similar data type for, for, for the vehicle. Uh, actually, it's written exactly the same as in Haskell. And then we have a helper function, uh, here it's called possibly vehicle, that takes a, a natural number and returns a type. So this is an example of, of a function that computes a type based on a value. So uh, if we pass in a number that is less than 18, it will return the unit type, it has only one value, it's written the same way, uh, open and close paren. And otherwise, it, return, it returns uh, the vehicle type. And then, how would we define the person type? So it's slightly more complicated, but not that much more compared to Haskell. So the first argument is the age, just like before. And the second argument uh, here, it's called B. We say that its type is determined based on the result of calling this function helper function, possibly vehicle, with the age argument. So here we are not hard coding uh, the, the type of this second argument just like we did in Haskell. Uh, instead, we are saying the type of the second argument depends on the value of the first argument. And then yeah, an error is missing and then we say that that's the person type. So here are just a few examples. So P1. Uh, that, that's a person uh, that has 11 years and has no vehicle, so it has uh, the unit value there, and that's of the unit type. But if you try to do something like make a person that is uh, 16 and has a car, this will not type check. Uh, Idris will say, no, this, this cannot happen. So by using dependent types here, we completely ruled out uh, a, 
a whole set of values that make no sense in our domain. And another legal example is this P3. It's a person that has 24 years and they can have a motorcycle. And if we ask, oh yeah, so how would we write the grid function in this case? It's quite similar to, to the Haskell version. We just use dependent pattern matching here. It's designated with, with the width uh, command. And we have, again, three cases. Um, so we check if the age is less than 18, that's this part. And it can be either true or false. So if it's true, if the person is underage, uh, for, the, for its V uh, argument, we know that it can be only the unit value. It can be nothing else. So it's this part here. And then there are two other cases uh, when the person is at least 18, when this condition is false. And then the person can have either a car or a motorcycle and we return a corresponding message. So this looks almost the same as the Haskell version, this grid function. The only difference is that we don't use guards, we use dependent pattern matching. And if you check Idris, if it covered all cases, and this is part of totality checking, it will say yes, it is total. So we exhaustively covered all possible cases um, with, with this uh, example. Okay, uh, th this was an example. We said when the person is uh, at least 18, they have a car. We could, of course, model it different way and said it can have a car but or a motorcycle, but it doesn't have to. So in this case, yes, we said it does have it, just to make it simpler. And then we come to the topic of termination. So what is termination? It answers the question, will your program eventually terminate? Uh, with its execution given given an input. And let's let's take a look at, at, at an example. So here is a simple function that computes the length of a, of a list. So again, we use pattern matching. And we say for the empty case, for the empty list case, we simply return zero. And then we use recursion and say, in the case it has a head and a list, it's one plus and then the length of the tail. It's very simple. And this is an example of, of a program you would argue it does terminate because it keeps on calling itself on a smaller and smaller argument, so it will eventually terminate. But then we can take a look at a slightly different example. So it's a, a function that takes an integer and returns an integer. And this is an example taken from a paper uh, titled Total Functional Programming. So in this case, uh, you, you can argue that we covered all cases because we, we said for any n, but still, uh, will this program terminate? Uh, even the, uh, the function's name suggests it will not because it will keep on looping. We are not decreasing this n argument and we keep on calling this function and it will actually never terminate. And let's try to apply mathematical reasoning because in functional programming, it's like doing mathematics, so we can do, for example, equational reasoning. So let's try that on this example. So if we substitute zero for n in the definition of the loop function, we get loop of zero is equal to one plus loop of zero, right? And of course, if we assume, if we assume that x minus x is zero, and, and and carry out this computation, what do we get? On the left-hand side, we are left with zero. Once we subtract loop zero from both sides, and on the right-hand side, we are left with one only. And then we get this weird equation that says zero is equal to one. Wow, what went wrong? What happened here? <laughs> So we went from a program like that on the top to, to a program that says that equal, that zero and one are equal. This is like really strange. 
So this happens because uh, n in this example, it's not simply an integer like 0, 1, 2, minus 1, minus 2, and so on. It's also a bottom value, or we also say an undefined integer. And when we have programs like that, we can end up in an infinite loop. And an infinite loop in programming actually corresponds to falsity in logic. So if we can have infinitely running programs, that would, in logic, mean we can prove anything. And here, loop is then a partial function because it, it doesn't terminate and therefore it's not suitable for equational reasoning. In general, this problem is known as the halting problem. Uh, it's been quite known for a long time in, in computability theory and back in 1936, Alan Turing proved that there is no general algorithm that would answer this question. Given a program description and an input, will your program terminate? But then you might ask, how come did Idris check that our earlier example, the grid function, did terminate? Well, the answer is simple. It doesn't uh, allow you to write any kind of functions. It restricts um, you to writing uh, a subset or a subclass of, of functions. So that basically means if you want to write programs in Idris and you want it to prove that your programs are total, you would have to adapt your style of programming. So to recap uh, this, this part on termination, we had an example with a head function that didn't have exhaustive pattern matching. And we also had a loop function that did have exhaustive pattern matching, but still it didn't terminate. So if you rely on such functions, as you might have experienced in practice, you will probably end up in dreadful debugging and, and, and fixing this bug. So um, now we can say what is a terminating function. First of all, it is defined for all well-typed inputs. And the second criteria is that it converges on a base case uh, if it has a recursive call. So we can see that the head example doesn't meet the first criteria because it's not defined for all lists. It's defined only for non-empty lists. And the second example doesn't converge on a base case because we are not decreasing this n or making it smaller. We just keep on passing on the same value. And then the second part of totality is productivity, which is uh, like the second half. So what uh, up to now we talked about programs that we want to terminate. But then again, as you know, we have programs that don't terminate, for example, a web server or an operating system. So what can you do there? And productivity is here defined as giving a non-empty finite prefix in a finite amount of time. Um, so, what means productivity in your case, in your program, it might be like printing to the console or fetching an HTTP request or whatever is specific to your domain, but in a finite amount of time. You want to guarantee that it will actually achieve this in, in some finite amount, amount of time. And here I will use an example from this book uh, titled Type Driven Development with Idris. Um, with slight adaptations, and it's basically an ever-running process. It's very simple. It just prints uh, a, a message to the console and keeps on calling itself. And we want to check if it's productive, that is, if it does produce some useful result in a finite amount of time. The first version is uh, not good, but we have to go through it to see why it's not good. So here we use a simple uh, data type. We called it uh, inf IO for infinite IO uh, computations. And it has only one way to construct a value. It's called do. It's like do in Haskell or similar languages. And it looks very like bind if you look at it. It takes a value and a function to transform um, a value in it, and it, it gives you the rest of the computation. And an example program is here called infproc, 
So what it does, it simply puts a string, it says lambda, and then it calls itself. And the bad version uh, of, of our program that does this uh, is called run prime here. It takes uh, a program of type int IO and it turns it into an actual IO in Haskell. So how does it look like? Well, it says simply for um, a given value C and, and a function F, extract uh, a value from, from this IO action. It's called res and call itself recursively uh, with F of res. So it runs this transformation, the rest of the computation and it calls itself. And here I had to mark this function as partial uh, because as we will see, this is not total. And why? why it's not total or productive in this case? Because we have no guarantee that this actually produced uh, useful results. Yes, I mean, this is a simple example. We can just check these two lines and say, yeah, it did run this action C, but it's more complex in general. So how can a compiler guarantee that the function is productive? One way to do that is to use the concept of fuel. So you're all familiar with it. Uh, you go to a gas station, you fill your tank, and it's full. But there is only so much of distance you can travel before running out of fuel. And this idea is uh, used in this approach to guarantee that uh, a function is productive. So we will use a drop of fuel in every iteration of, of interpretation of our program. And then we can say this run prime function will also take a fuel argument and it will consume a drop of fuel every time and when it gets to an empty tank, when it's out of fuel, when, well, that, that, that's the way we will uh, guarantee it will eventually uh, terminate. And this enables us to push um, infinite execution out of this crucial part, so the run prime function is crucial here, or critical, um, and this is quite useful because then we can check that the run function is actually productive. So we will use a helper data type, it's called fuel. It's, it looks actually very like natural numbers. It has a base case and a, an ind inductive case, and here, because it receives a strict language, we have to say that in the second case, when we have more fuel, uh, this argument to it is lazily evaluated. And an example is uh, a variable called two drops. It's, it's just two drops of fuel. So how do we construct such a value? Well, we say it's more of more of dry. So we have more occurring twice. And then if we want to construct an infinite tank, well, we would say it's called forever and it's simply more of forever. So it keeps on referring to itself, but of course this will never actually evaluate. So we have to uh, annotate it as, as partial. And here is an improved version that, that will actually uh, be total. So again, just like before, we have the, the info data type. It's the same as before and the same example program, infprog. But now our uh, function that runs our programs described in this simple language, infio, it takes another argument compared to our earlier version. It's, it's just fuel. And we do pattern matching on these two cases. So either we are out of fuel, it's this last case, and then we don't care what's the value of the second argument and simply we say, okay, we are out of fuel. But of course, the interesting case is here when uh, we do have some fuel, so it's more off fuel, and just like before, we run the IO action, see, and get a result in res, and again, we call recursively the run function, but now you can see we are passing in this additional argument, fuel, but this lead, this is running into a, a, a base case because here in the pattern match, we deconstructed it into a more of fuel 
and here we are passing in fuel only. So it's a smaller value. And if we pass, for example, two drops to this function, it will run only for two iterations. But this will also enable us to, run, uh, to pass in that forever value. It will keep on running this interpreter for forever. So yeah, the point is here that we introduced an additional argument that tells us for how many steps we can run this, uh, this interpreter. And then if we ask Idris if, oh, that's, that's in a slide, but here is an example. Uh, we can run it with two drops of fuel, and then it will simply print lambda twice, and it will say no more fuel. But then again, if we call it with the forever value, which is an infinite amount of fuel, then it will keep on printing lambda, 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 and so on. It will never terminate. But if you ask Idris if this run function, the new version, is total, it will say, yes, it is. And how come it can say it's total? Well, because we keep on calling itself on a smaller and smaller fuel argument. We keep on decreasing it. And we are productive here because we do run an IO action. It's called C here. So totality comprises um, two things. Uh, it's termination and productivity. And we can say that a total function is either, uh, it either terminates on, on, uh, on a well-defined uh, uh, data type, uh, the input, or it's uh, productive, as in it produces a non-empty uh, finite prefix of, of a potentially infinite result in a finite amount of time. And as uh, the way you can see your programs is like you, you can split them into two parts. Uh, one is uh, a finite part, and the second one is an infinite part. The finite part is one uh, the one where you have terminating functions, and you want to guarantee those to be uh, uh, terminating. You want to be sure they will eventually finish their execution. But then you can have the second, or usually you do have the second part, which is an infinite part. And you want to have as many functions as possible in the, that part that are guaranteed to be productive. Um, you will have functions like, I haven't, I'm not sure I gave it as an example here, but for example, your main function, that would be an example of a partial function. But by pushing uh, more and more functions into totality, you you have way fewer points in your program to check for errors. When a runtime error happens, you know it's in the part of your program that is not total. So this kind of helps you uh, navigate your code when, when you're debugging. When you get a runtime bug, you're sure it's in a part that is not total. So to recap totality, uh, it, com uh, it consists of two things, it's termination and productivity. And unlike with the head function and with the loop function here, we can safely apply uh, mathematical reasoning, like equational reasoning, because these functions are total and we can use our mathematical knowledge in making sure uh, the code has certain properties. And you can see a link here to uh, the so-called Curry-Howard isomorphism. It's, it's an isomorphism that says that programming is like logic. And if you work with partial functions, you cannot guarantee your code will not have runtime errors. And it's, if you try to map this into logic, if you had partial proofs, how would you be able to use these partial proofs in writing more complex proofs? Um, so, did, if you're interested in, in literature related to this topic, it, there is a paper that I mentioned by David Turner, Total Functional Programming. But there are also nice books. Um, for example, uh, Edwin Brady's Type Driven Development with, with Idris. Um, it's a very practical uh, book on 
using dependent types and interactive program development. And it covers uh, totality throughout the book. Uh, there is also a book by Aaron Stump. Uh, one particular chapter, chapter nine, on termination proofs. Uh, the book is called Verified Functional Programming. It's in Agda, but it's, it's a language quite similar to, to Idris. And then there is a quite new book by Friedman and Christensen, The Little Typer. It's from The Little Series. Um, they write about dependent type theory and how you can use it to, to write your programs. So to conclude, uh, I covered uh, function totality where we used, uh, we relied on smaller functions to write bigger functions. These were, these were our building blocks. Um, and I hope uh, I conveyed the idea that uh, totality supports abstraction because if your uh, smaller functions are total, and you build up your bigger and bigger functions and they're all total, you don't have to worry that there is a case that you haven't covered in these lower level functions. And if your function is not total, there are things that you can do. Uh, you can change its domain or codomain that is in general adapt its type to make sure that you have exhaustive pattern matching. And in the end, it's, it's a very nice uh, feeling that can rely on your compiler, in this case on Idris compiler, as a verification tool. Um, we'll check uh, if your program is terminating or not. Um, if you're interested in, in dependent types, I will also have a workshop on, on Saturday. It will be in Agda though, uh, but as I said, it's quite similar to Idris. And this is it, it I'm done, thank you. Okay, so we have time for questions. So I'm going to be a little bit of a devil's advocate here. I want to ask about the run function in particular. So we started off with a run function, which might not terminate, and so we had to label it partial. And then we started jumping through hoops. We introduced a fuel type, we made the definition of run more complicated, and finally, we got a guarantee from the type checker that the run function will actually terminate. And then when we want to use it, we pass in forever. And what do you know? We've got a run function that might fall into a loop. So we jumped through hoops, but we've ended up, haven't we, in the same position that we were when we started, really? Is, it, is there really value in the fuel trick for functions like this? Well, I would argue there is value because you push the infinite part out of your run function and okay, we, we had to call it like, where is that example? Uh, so here we call it with a forever fuel, but I would say that this is, this is better than the, the first version because Idris can now guarantee that this function is total and this is a, a critical part of our program and we want to make sure it's defined on all inputs and it will actually be productive. It will not, for example, run into a deadlock. This is, this is one example. So if, if you have a total function, you're guaranteed, you can, you can use dependent types and you can make sure it will not run into deadlock. So that, that's a nice property of a program to have, I would, I would argue. But I'm not sure if I really answered your question. So I think you did answer my question. You're saying that if we leave the run function labeled partial, then it might type check, even though it calls other partial functions that might fail for other reasons. When we jump through the hoops, we know that the only reason that run can loop is because, um, because it used an infinite amount of fuel. All of the things that it calls are guaranteed to be total. So thank you. Hi, thanks for the great presentation. Uh, my question is about what are our options in that Haskell example you showed where Haskell is not able to um, express that guarantee of, of totality even though we look like in, intuitively that we compose that pat um, um, pattern matching correctly. Uh, 
are, do we have options there on how to maybe refactor that that uh, that uh, bit on to 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 have that guarantee, or is just not an option there? So I'm no Haskell expert, I would argue, and maybe John would be able to answer this question better. But um, yes, I think in general you can uh, write your uh, functions and programs. Oh, a movie mode. Um, uh, <laughs> um, yes, I, I guess you can uh, write it in a different way and maybe use different guards. And what, what would help there, I think if you added, let's go back to that example. Um, it is, okay, that's Idris Haskell. I think if, if you added the case, though I'm not completely sure, I should give it a try with a guard that says otherwise or in, in all remaining cases, then then you would cover, then Haskell would be able to say, okay, you covered all cases for sure. But I think uh, it's uh, Haskell's uh, checking for exhaustive pattern matching is a bit limited. Uh, so I don't know, maybe John can. Yeah, can I make a comment about that? So one difference between this Haskell code and your address code is that in the Haskell code, you test two things. You test age is less than limit or age is greater than or equal to limit. If you just go to the next slide. Yeah. Here, you only test less than, and then you pattern match that against true and false. And Idris knows that there are only two Booleans. It doesn't have to know that less than and greater than or equal are, you know, together cover all cases. Actually, Haskell knows there are only two Booleans also. So I think if you were to rewrite the code where you just perform one comparison and then you match on the result, that would probably be accepted by the Haskell uh, totality checker. Thank you for this clarification. Another question? Maybe this was in your slide and I just looked over it. But you noted that like, um, you push the uh, the code where like the the infinite loop can happen. You push this outwards in your program. Is this is this recorded in the the type system somewhere or some in some other manner? For example, in Cock Theorem Prover, it would like distinguish between functions and co-functions. Like functions will always uh, terminate. They will always do the recursion on a smaller function. And for co-functions, you only know they're productive and they're they're, they're guarded. Uh, does address make this distinction as well? As far as I know, uh, Idris type system doesn't have this uh, termination checking within uh, its type system, so it's it's like a separate thing, uh, I would say. I'm not sure I got your question. Okay. Oh no, it's not hanging. I mean, that, that that's a different thing. So. It, it will run forever, but because it keeps on calling itself on a smaller argument and it's producing a, a, a result in by consuming a single drop, uh, it's, it's I mean, that's total. So you, you can run, call this run function with a forever argument from some other function, but you, you're guaranteed that, uh, you know, if a runtime error happens, it's not because of, calling this run function. It's, it's something else because a function, uh, for it to be total, all of the function it calls, they also have to be total. So you're guaranteed if, if uh, a runtime error happens, it's because some higher level up uh, function that is partial and uh, called this function. Any more questions? I don't see anyone, so if, if not, thank you again, Mark. Thank you.